Mr. President, <coughs> Governor Landon, my friends, may I say first, <coughs> may I thank you first of all, Mr. President, for that more than gracious introduction. It's really worth coming to Kansas to hear those nice introductions. <laughs> may I also say how absolutely delighted I am to be here giving the Landon Lecture, uh, this Landon Lecture. I don't know uh, how many people in Kansas are aware of how much those of us who live in the East have been grateful in these last years, in the last quarter century for that matter, but particularly in the more frantic years of the Cold War uh, and in those years when people were seeking to pers persuade themselves that China didn't exist and that uh, uh, there was something peculiarly uh, wise and heroic about our uh, misadventure in Vietnam, how good, how much we welcome this calm and reasonable voice of Alf M. Landon's uh, questioning uh, so much of uh, the nonsense uh, that had come to pass as foreign policy. Uh, and uh, it gives me uh, as it would give many others great pleasure to be here uh, in a role which uh, allows me at least to pay my thanks to Governor Landon. Uh, he's, he's in the great tradition of American progressive thought and in the really great tradition of Midwestern stubborn independence. <laughs> I particularly appreciated those occasions when he took out after the Republicans. <laughs> a few months ago, friends of mine who were starting a new magazine asked me one of those obvious questions, which on occasion one should ask himself. It was, what went wrong with American foreign policy in these last 10 years? Why, as almost everyone agrees, have we made such a mess of things? What are the lessons from these mistakes? This question, or the two questions, have been, I must say, haunting me ever since. When I was asked this question last summer, I wrote a short answer for uh, the, my friends for the magazine they were starting. But I found myself coming back to the problem uh, repeatedly, and when I came to think of uh, a topic uh, which would be appropriate to the occasion this evening, I found myself coming back to it again. There can be no question that next only to the cities, and more even than the problems of, the, of drugs and the young, foreign policy has come to be considered the disaster area of American life. And foreign policy and the associated military operations, expenditures, and activities receive a good share of the blame, and I think rightly, for the misuse of resources and the misdirection of energies which have got the cities into such trouble. And our military operations and the associated bestiality and death have certainly had something to do with the alienation and revolt of the young. So it would be well that we do know what went wrong. When the decade began, well, ten years ago last January, uh, one could not have foreseen this series of disasters. The promise then was extraordinarily bright. Most, some of you at least, are old enough to remember the glittering language of President Kennedy's inaugural address when speaking of foreign policy he <clears throat> said, let the word go forth to friend and foe alike, implying that American foreign policy uh, carried with it a drama uh, and, an, and, a, uh, and a wisdom uh, that from which the world could only benefit. Almost everyone I then knew, I was some measure a part of that particular scene, uh, was very much concerned with spreading the word. I've said many times uh, in those weeks 
Uh, no one particularly wanted to be Secretary of the Treasury. Even the handling of all that money was singularly uh, unexciting. Uh, it was a real job to find somebody to be Secretary of Agriculture. But it mattered terribly who was to be Secretary of State or Under Secretary of State, and there was even some interest in being an Assistant Secretary of State, although there are enough Assistant Secretaries of State to form a small union. <laughs> in, the, in the early months of the new administration, uh, the whole focus of interest and concern was on foreign policy, and all sorts of marvelous ideas were spawned for improving or revising uh, or otherwise uh, developing our overseas stance. There was to be an expanded and reorganized aid program, a grand design for Europe, although there was some doubt as to what that design consisted of, the Alliance for Progress, the Kennedy Round of Tariff Reductions, the Multilateral Force, uh, the Peace Corps, counterinsurgency activities, an expanded recognition of the role of the new Africa, and numerous other enterprises uh, which didn't quite ever get the dignity of a, of a, of a wholly satisfactory rejection. Now, ten years later, uh, ten years last January, one looks back on a seemingly uninterrupted series of disasters. There was the there was this terrible business at the Bay of Pigs. Absolutely incredible thing when one looks back at it, on it, which the CIA and the Joint Chiefs loaded on to the new president, a fantastic enterprise for uh, sailing into the, uh, sailing onto the coast of Cuba, uh, overthrowing a government there. And there was the invasion of the Dominican Republic to put down a communist revolution in which the communists had to be invented after the fact. Uh, there was severe, there has been severe alienation in the other uh, Latin American countries. Broken windows and burned libraries and somebody once said a few, a uh, year or two ago that the mark of the common, of the modern diplomat indeed was not his striped pants but the putty knife that he carried around to put back the glass. Uh, and over everything else, we've had the brooding, frustrating, endlessly bloody, and infinitely expensive, and now widely rejected war in Indochina. Or at least so it seems as we look back. And at least one of the successes of these years, I feel compelled to say, seems to me a good deal less compelling when one looks back on it. President Kennedy was greatly praised for the skill and the courage with which he handled the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, but I must confess to some, some uh, less, uh, a less sanguine view of that whole event than the historians now accord it, or so far do. In the Cuban Missile Crisis, President Kennedy was faced uh, with the need to balance the danger of blowing up the world against the risk of political attack at home for seeming to appease communists. And this, from his point of view, was not an irresponsible choice. If he ignored the domestic opposition, he always risked the possibility that he might lose the initiative and lose office even to an even harder line, even tougher uh, policy as regards, uh, the, uh, as regards Cuba or the Soviets. But there is surely something a little wrong with a political system that poses a choice for a president between the survival of mankind and domestic political compulsions. I don't think the missile crisis showed the strength of our policy. I think it showed the catastrophic visions and the resulting pressures to which it was subject. We were in luck on that particular occasion but I don't think we should ever suppose, and certainly never in a good, righteous, Calvinist state like Kansas, that success in a lottery uh, 
is an argument for lotteries. Yet not everything in these years went wrong. Our relations with Western Europe and Japan, Japan in these years caused no particular pain. Western Europe and Japan, we need to remind ourselves, have been the theaters of our greatest misfortunes in this uh, century, the great, always assuming that the war, that war, World War I, World War II, uh, that war is our greatest misfortune. And during the 1960s, on the whole, relations with the communist countries improved, both in the vision and I think also in the reality. When the decade of the 60s began, the official vision of the communist world was still that of a political monolith. That word was still much used. A political monolith rentlessly bent on the destruction of what very few people were embarrassed to call the free world. If there were divisions within the communist world, as Secretary Rusk used to like to say, it was only on how best to pursue the destruction of, to pursue their revolution. Foreign policy, accordingly, was just one weapon in a larger conflict, that larger conflict being the Cold War. Dean Rusk was criticized for his conviction that foreign policy was subordinate to military convenience. But, of course, if conflict with the communist world is the great and inevitable fact, then his view was at least consistent. Diplomacy, like truth, is always one of the casualties of war. <clears throat> but the vision of a never-ending conflict with the communist world has now largely dissolved. There are believers in, this, in the inevitability of this struggle uh, who can still be found in the more airless recesses of the Pentagon, <laughs> Retired chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, <laughs> comic figures like Joe Alsop, retired, <clears throat> retired diplomats solemnly contemplating their martinis at the Metropolitan Club. These people... These people still evoke the communist conspiracy on which their personal fame and fortune was founded. <laughs> and, and they rejoice accordingly in anything that seems to suggest a revival of the conflict. And they try to warn a generation that doesn't share their wisdom. But, but their audience dwindles and the terrible fact obtrudes. We have seen that the communist world is as relentlessly divided as the non-communist world, and that, the, that China and the Soviet Union are at least as far from coordinated action as France and the United States. <laughs> On the record, too, we have learned, and this is, I think, terribly important, that the communist powers are cautious, but they're probably rather more cautious than has been the government of the United States in the past about risking disaster in an effort to convert the world to their system. But there has also been a change in these 10 years in the substance of world affairs. When the decade began, the United States and the USSR were each equipped with weapons capable even at the lowest levels of military expectation, and our levels of our of and our our expectation on matters of uh, military calculation have been brought somewhat into focus by things like the C5A. Even at the lowest levels of military expectation, we were at the beginning of the decade equipped on each side. Each side was equipped with weapons capable of destroying each other and most of the world between. At the end of the decade, each was capable of destroying the other from five to 15 times over. 
The difference to a population already dead is <laughs> between being destroyed once and being destroyed 15 times is not mathematically decisive. <laughs> Meantime, and here one can speak with certainty, only of the, with certainty only of the United States, there has been a considerable accretion of knowledge, both about the insecurity inherent in the weapons race and the unwisdom of leaving the contest under the control of the armed services and the affiliated weapons industries. It would be ob optimistic to suggest that this control of affairs by the weapons culture has yet been broken. But the emergence of the Pentagon and its power as a political issue is one of the major developments of these last years. Uh, it is something for which one could hardly have hoped at the beginning of the decade. Meanwhile, Tension between the two superpowers has diminished in other respects. In the United States, there is not the same conviction of total economic and social success that there was in 1960 at the crest of what we economists have come to call the Keynesian Revolution. One senses, without being quite sure, that similar doubts have come to obtain in the Soviet Union. I was reminiscing last night uh, about this problem. Uh, I'm going to sacrifice my relatively well-developed and carefully cultivated reputation for modesty if I tell you that uh, <laughs> the last 10 or 20 years I've discovered that I've become a tourist attraction. Uh, <laughs> that after visiting Battle Green and the bridge at Concord, most tourists coming to New England go to have a look at Galbraith. Uh, and pursuant to this uh, contribution that I am making to the New England Council and the Boston Chamber of Commerce, I have an extraordinary number of Japanese and Soviet visitors. Over the last 10 years, I can't help noticing the way in which, uh, the difference in the way in which my Soviet visitors come in. Uh, it used to be, there used to be a kind of assertive tendency which they would uh, sit down to chat about the virtues of their system. I would find myself in the rather unnatural role of defending the American system. <laughs> uh, and uh, this would be the level of the conver at which the conversation would proceed. Now, uh, this last year or two, uh, Russian professors come in uh, they're very likely to say, well, Professor Galbraith, you know, you think you have problems in your country, but let me tell you about some of the problems that we have. Uh, uh. At the beginning of the decade, to accept the idea of coexistence with world communism suggested a slightly defective moral stance. It induced a raised eyebrow in many circles. Perhaps Khrushchev was coming through a bit too well. Now that existence and coexistence are identical, few people doubt. That the great industrial societies have requ common requirements in planning. Great industrial societies, the United States and the USSR, have common requirements in planning, industrial discipline and organization, and common disasters in their environmental effects is at least being discussed. Richard Nixon in the 50s spoke the lines of a militant cold warrior. It was on that that to some extent he founded his career. John F. Kennedy, 10 years ago, was at least moderately in the opposition camp. Yet enough has changed in the last 10 years so that Mr. Nixon's expressions as president on the communist menace are both fewer and much more pacific than were those of Mr. Kennedy. No one will argue, I think, where Mr. Nixon is concerned, that he is re re could be responding to anything so simple as a change in conviction. 
difficult problems remain between the United States and the Soviet Union. No bilateral relationship that depends on the ability of each side to destroy the other side can be regarded with equanimity or considered stable. Circumstances and politics have given us different and hostile clients and friends in the Middle East. But still, it seems to me, the larger fact remains. It was not, it was not our relations with the Soviet Union that made our foreign policy in the 60s the mess that we have now come, quite correctly, to consider it. The disaster area of our foreign policy has been in what knowing people now call the Third World. It was here in Cuba, the Dominican Republic, the rest of Latin America, and most of all in Indochina, that the mistakes were made or the disasters occurred. Had it not been for the policy in this part of the world, had it not been for the policy in the Third World, Lyndon Johnson would still be President of the United States, the wishes of his wife notwithstanding. <laughs> Dane Rusk would still be Secretary of State, or if after eight years he had gone into honorable retirement, it would be as President of a college well on the establishment side of the Mason-Dixon line. <laughs> My old friend Walt Rostow would be back at MIT, uh, none of these men would be reflecting as they should be reflecting that it was the third world that was their great foreign policy trap. On the visible evidence, I venture to think this has also been true of the Soviet Union. If from the Soviet Foreign Office anyone has recently been shipped to Outer Mongolia to be ambassador to Ulaanbaatar, it has not been for his handling of relations with France or Germany or Britain or the United States. It was because it was the man that got shipped there was the man who handled Indonesia or North Korea or, above all, China. It was, in other words, there where Soviet policy, so far as we can tell, also ran off the rails. Again, the third world. I venture to think there may have been a few people from the Soviet Foreign Office got shipped to Ulaanbaatar also for their handling of Arab affairs, but I don't want to go into that. <laughs> Foreign policy is a gentlemanly profession which sets much store by tradition and continuity, even in error. Introspection and even thought, I discovered when I was an ambassador, are on the whole held in rather low esteem in the diplomatic estate. However, even brief reflection on the recent history of our relations with the Third World will, as we ask ourselves what went wrong, suggest that we made policy in that part of the world on the basis of a startling succession of wrong assumptions. The assumptions being wrong, the results caused us deep trouble. What remains is to recognize uh, that a shift in the assumptions from wrong to right would even now produce better results. Such recognition does not come easily, as I shall presently argue. A bureaucracy defends, with righteousness, the wrong assumptions if they happen to be the ones on which it is operating. But first, let me list what we have learned from dealing with the third world in the last decade. Four lessons seem to me clear. I hope, by the way, you're comfortable because I didn't come all the way out from Cambridge to give you a purely perfunctory address. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm... As Churchill, <clears throat> Mr. Churchill once said during World War II, we haven't, we're not approaching the beginning of the end. We're gradually getting to the end of the beginning. <laughs> we have learned, first of all, the limits on our power in the third world. 
Following World War II in Western Europe, we developed what we may properly possibly call the Marshall Plan Syndrome. This view, based on the very great success of the Marshall Plan from 1947 on, held that the United States could always work wonders in other countries. Our capital, our energy, our economic system, our idealism, our business statesmen, and our special standing with the benign God all combined, <laughs> all combined to produce such a capacity for miracles. It seemed so in Europe after World War II. But there we need to remind ourselves that economic organization or the capacity for such organization and the existence of great industrial skills and great technical competence and a highly developed public administration already existed. The only missing ingredient in Western Europe after World War II were the, was the supply of capital and also the special blessings of providence. When these two things were supplied by the United States, <laughs> it is perhaps not surprising that a miracle of recovery followed. <laughs> we, have now, we have now learned in the hardest of schools that elsewhere in the world things are different. Where the pre-existing European ingredients of success and rapid economic development are missing, the power to work miracles is not surprisingly non-existent. Where organizational, administrative, and technical capacity and skills are lacking, where in short there is no industrial base or experience, the economic system does not respond to the mere infusion of money, of capital. For capital, in that case, is not the missing ingredient. In, in the colonial era, European powers had a substantial influence on the inner life and development of the third world countries. This influence they exercised by creating and imposing a structure of administration. And having, having created this structure of information, they didn't influence these countries, they governed. Given this public framework, industrial, railroad, and modern agricultural develop development could be induced in reasonably predictable fashion if the policy so prescribed. But the modern third world no longer allows such an imposed solution. Thus it has come about that the superpower which seeks to intervene in the third world remains substantially the victim of the organizational, administrative, and technical vacuum, which, after all, is what tends to distinguish this world. The second lesson that we have learned, or more precisely are relearning, is that communism and capitalism are concepts of practical significance only at an advanced state in e stage in industrial development. In poor rural societies, they have only, the distinction has only a rhetorical significance. Capitalism is not an issue in a country that is yet to experience capitalism. And communism is not, in those countries, an alternative. The third world consists by definition of poor rural societies. That is what underdeveloped countries are. It follows that whether such countries call themselves free free enterprise, capitalist, socialist, or communist, has at the lower levels of economic development only terminological significance. They are poor and rural before they start describing themselves as communist, and they are poor and rural after they start describing themselves as communist. For the <coughs> even by the crudest of power calculus, which, to which I myself do not subscribe, Military or economic, such nations have no vital relation to the economic or strategic position of the developed countries. They do supply raw materials, but even here, the typical observation concerns not their power, not their importance in this role, but their weakness as salesmen. It is hard to see why so much tension developed in the 50s and early 60s 
over whether the countries of the third world would follow the communist or non-communist pattern of development. That alternatives to capitalism only become interesting after there is capitalism is a proposition that was eloquently affirmed by Marx over a hundred years ago. And that capitalism is an issue only if there is capitalism is a proposition that is not in its essentials difficult to grasp. <laughs> in part, no doubt, our error was the result of a fantastic overestimate, as it now seems, of the speed of economic development in the third world. Latin American, African, and Asian countries, it was thought, would soon be industrialized. Therewith, they would become military powers. And then, and thus to global strategists, and this was a relentlessly amateur calling of which the United States nurtured an alarming number of people in, after World War II, to amateur military, to, glo to global military strategists, it seemed important accordingly that the ideological affiliation of the Third World be not with Moscow and Peking, but with Washington and lower Manhattan. We, we now know a few special cases such as Formosa and Israel apart, that the process of development is infinitely slow, that the ultimate organization of these societies is far too academic a question to influence the policymaking even of the most passionate ideologue. We now know that by the time India Pakistan, Sub-Saharan Africa, most of Central or South America are industrialized to anything approaching American or Western European levels, even greater changes will have occurred in the United States and the Soviet Union. Third, we have learned that although the inner life and development of the third world is beyond the reach of the power of a superpower, and equally, I think, beyond its visible self-concern, that the effort to influence that development brings into being a very large civilian and military organization, a very large civilian and military bureaucracy. Colonial power was exercised rather simply through a line of command, which in general gave orders working as we are supposed to do by way of the hearts and minds and pocketbooks of a people, requires a much more massive table of organization. This is partly because the influence exercised in this way is very disappointing. And the normal bureaucratic answer to frustration and non-effect is to get more, many, <clears throat> more money and more men and build a bigger organization that often, although not invariably, accomplishes even less. And so we have spawned this very large bureaucracy, military missions, military advisors, counterinsurgency teams, pacification teams, technical assistance teams, advisors on aid utilization, auditors and inspectors, and other instruments against indigenous larceny, Information, <laughs> information officers, intelligence officers, spooks. Uh, the list of people that are required for this effort extends almost indefinitely. Whereas in Vietnam and Laos the frustration has been nearly total, the bureaucratic input has been all but infinite. But elsewhere, as well as, <coughs> but elsewhere in Asia and Latin America and in lesser degree in Africa, the 60s saw the deployment of a huge American military, counterinsurgency, intelligence, diplomatic, public information, and aid establishment designed to counter communism. Four. We have learned that an overseas bureaucracy, once in existence, develops a life and a purpose of its own. Control by Washington is exiguous, and control by Congress is, for all practical purposes, non-existent. This is partly because of the nature of its task. A government that is being protected by a superpower 
and being subsidized by a superpower, wishes at a minimum to have the deed done in private. And, and the same is true of a foreign politician. Decency and reticence have their claims. Surveillance of communists, moreover, or more active military operations to put down subversion, also require public reticence. It is axiomatic that in such matters one doesn't show one's hand to the other side. Secrecy is also occasioned by the intrinsically high failure rate in these operations. Much, much of the work of our intelligence and military missions abroad is only possible because no one is aware, is aware of how little is obtained for the outlay involved. I, I had occasion while I was in India uh, to develop a special uh, thesis on intelligence operations. Uh, it's, came, it's called, I hope, trust will, historians will refer to it as Galbraith's first law of intelligence. Uh, it is that no one can tell anything useful about the intentions of a government that doesn't know itself. Uh, and, that, and that ordinarily is the situation in the third world. Few men in the the sheer number and variety of our overseas op operations makes them difficult to control. Few men in the executive branch in Washington remain in office long enough to have knowledge of affairs of which nominally they are in charge. Legislators who must rely on such men for knowledge and who have no knowledge have even less knowledge. <laughs> this This autonomy is combined in turn with the tendency for any bureaucracy, military or civilian, in the absence of the strongest of leadership, to continue to do whatever it is doing. This is a matter of the highest importance, one that, in my view, explains the basic tendencies of our foreign policy, and it calls, it seems to me, for special attention. The tendency of a great organization to find purpose in whatever it is doing is superbly revealed by the experience of the past decade in Indochina. Without exception, every reason originally offered for our intervention in Vietnam has now dissolved, and some have become ludicrous. This is not the prejudiced view of an opponent of the war, not even the few remaining supporters of the conflict affirm the original reasons for that adventure. No one now says, though it was doctrine in the early 60s, that our action in Vietnam is in response to a probe deliberately directed from Moscow or Peking. There was always some confusion as to which. And, and thus was part of the larger global strategy of communism and therefore to be resisted as such. No one says that anymore, or not many. That the NLF carries the banners of Vietnamese nationalism, that we are involved in a civil war, is now generally, if not quite universally, accepted. Once it was also asserted that vital American military and strategic interests were involved, it was said quite literally and quite soberly, that if we did not fight in the jungles of Vietnam, we would soon be assaulted in the Philippines or even on the beaches of Hawaii or in the extremes of imagination they would put in at Santa Monica. <laughs> now these contentions are offered only as an exercise in irony. Once it was held that we were saving the fledgling democracy of General Chu and Marshal Key, two, <laughs> two uniquely Jeffersonian figures that had sprung up. In <laughs> no one quite has the courage to say that anymore. <laughs> Only a few weeks ago, Enormous energy was expended on keeping, a few months ago, 
was expended on keeping Marshal Key from coming to Washington at the, at the invitation of Reverend McIntyre, a man who has a really special relationship with God. Um, <laughs> he deeply believes that God put his sword in his hand in order to use it against his enemies. Uh, enormous effort was cranked up to keep the Reverend McIntyre from bringing Marshal Key to Washington for a political rally uh, for fear Marshal Key would remind Americans just before our own election of the repressive, obscene, and incompetent dictatorship with which we were associated. Once it was held that there were dominoes. No one mentions the domino doctrine anymore because that reminds people that it was the war itself that tumbled the first domino in Cambodia. Once it was held in defense of the war that purpose aside, it could readily be won by military means. Now the suggestion that the Pentagon is seeking military victory in Vietnam provokes an indignant denial. They say they're doing no such thing. Once it was a defense of the war, that it was a marginal exercise which Ameri the American economy could take in stride. Guns could be had along with the butter. Now it is sound doctrine that the war caused the inflation of the latter 60s that still frustrates good economic management. And that the war is in conflict with a sensible priority and resource use has become a cliché. It is impossible to think of a case more intellectually inert than that for the Vietnam War. And yet the force that keeps uh, it continuing, that presses it on, uh, that pressed for this most recent adventure into Laos, continues. And this is not uh, because, well, I it's certainly not, I think one can reasonably say, because there is great pressure for this from the universities and from the, uh, <laughs> and from the intelligentsia of the United States, militant as it is. Uh, I, I confess to departing, uh, ra <coughs> to departing here uh, rather sharply from the radical cliches which holds that it is a, uh, all a plot of businessmen in Wall Street. That is nonsense. Uh, this is uh, uh, the, if any particular group in the United States has been more, act, more usefully active in opposition to the war than any other, I must say it has been the businessmen. Uh, I speak very feelingly on this. Uh, the, uh, how do you think Gene McCarthy ran for president? Uh, and who put up the money for that campaign? And it was quite expensive, much more expensive than Gene himself realized. Uh, that money didn't come from college students, rich as they are. Uh, <laughs> or it didn't come from professors, and it didn't come much of it from professional people. Most of the money that was required for that campaign came from businessmen. A lot of it came from Wall Street. And I can attest to that fact because I helped raise an awful lot of it. Uh, and I know who it was that wrote those checks. Uh, the thing that keeps this war going is the bureaucratic momentum of the Pentagon. Uh, that and these larger and more subtle ex explanations, it seems to me, divert our attention uh, from that truth. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry to see attention diverted from that fact. The uh, other organizations as well. The CIA unquestionably cherishes the interest of the personal drama and the excitement and the outlet for money that go with its Laotian adventures. <laughs> and the Air Force unquestionably needs bombing as a reason for its existence. Since Korea, we've been learning and relearning the lesson that strategic air power is ineffective against primitive agriculture or men <laughs> move. <laughs> or men moving at night 
along jungle roads. I had, uh, I had charge of the Air Force intelligence at the end of World War II, which discovered what the uh, Air Force accomplished on the ground. Uh, we learned at that time that the Air Force wasn't highly effective against agriculture. Uh, this has never had any effect on Air Force doctrine because it happens not to be what the Air Force needs to believe. But it would be a mistake to picture bureaucratic need in terms of a too specific bureaucratic self-interest. I don't even think that bureaucratic self-interest is basically uh, is, is the total story. Nothing in the history of the armed services of the United States has been so damaging for the Army uh, and for its morale and esprit as this terrible mistake in Vietnam. A more important factor, as I say, is the pure organizational momentum. Bureaucracy, organization, can always continue to do what it is doing. And it is incapable on its own of a drastic change of course. And the process by which it ensures its continuity, uh, in the case of the Pentagon, by which it prepares budgets, persuades the Bureau of the Budget, uh, persuades its sycophants in the Congress, all of this is itself highly bureaucratized and highly organized. And thus we have the momentum carrying us along in Indochina even after the national purpose has dissolved. The lessons of the 1960s as regards foreign policy are then both specific and self-reinforcing. What remains, as I said at the outset, is to act on these lessons. The area where our course most needs correction is not Western Europe or vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union or vis-a-vis -vis Japan. Doubtless there are improvements to be made in both places, but the past here has not been intolerable. Relations with the Soviet Union, including the indirect encounters in the Middle East and Berlin, include a component of latent risk. And I take very seriously the risk that is uh, latent in the nuclear confrontation and the chance that these things, uh, that a nuclear exchange can get started by accident. But it was not here in the last decade that we stumbled. We stumbled in the third world. In this world, we cannot intervene, need not intervene, and we have intervened. The effort has required a large bureaucracy, military, and civilian. And this, by its nature, cannot be controlled. Acting where action is both impossible of effect and unnecessary, this bureaucracy has not surprisingly produced very bad consequences. Given the nature of bureaucracy, there is great persistence in these evil consequences. None of this, given the underlying analysis, is altogether surprising and the remedial action is also clear. It is greatly and promptly to contract our policy in the third world, in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. This means that the lesson of the last 10 years is specifically that we no longer can, should, need, uh, or wisely will stand guard against what is called communism in these parts of the planet. It means that we no longer should distinguish between governments that we like and those of which we disapprove. It means specifically uh, that over the generality, it means specifically that we deal with all and that we recognize all. And this means, of course, Cuba, China, North Korea, and the rest. It means that over the generality of Latin America, Africa, and Asia, military missions must be withdrawn and military aid should come to an end. So also, in all three continents, do activities that are conducted under the ambit of counterinsurgency and counter-subversive and intelligence operations. <clears throat> 
It means that the remaining military bases related to the defense of these areas must be given up. It means that henceforth the raison d'etre of our aid and our information programs is to assist economic development and to inform countries as regards to the United States, and it is not to fight communism. I set very great store uh, by the continuing and compassionate importance of foreign aid. Foreign aid means that these country in these countries, but, but it means that in these countries we return to orthodox diplomatic re relations and give the assistance in capital, technique, or volunteer manpower that is a, an inner obligation of a technically advanced and affluent country for those who are so infinitely poorer than we are. As I say, we don't distinguish between good and bad governments. We recognize and trade with all. I venture to think that there are some very considerable business advantages uh, from relieving our world commerce of the incubus that uh, exists in the feeling that American business has always, is always associated with some larger imperial ambition. And I might add that as the events of the last two days indicate, our balance of payments is not all that strong that we can afford the luxury uh, of uh, having our commerce uh, suspect. Foreign policy, especially of the more belligerent sort, is regularly formulated with a view to rejoicing its author and his, his audience with its therapeutic simplicity. This is not my present intention. What I have urged is what must be done. It follows that although the broad rule of non-intervention and non-presence applies to all of the third world, differing history will differ will lead to differing time schedules uh, in our with in our withdrawal. Withdrawal, for example, from the Philippines, where we've been for a long time, will have to be negotiated. And I wouldn't urge an abrupt withdrawal from Korea. This is a peaceful situation. One doesn't have a sufficient number of peaceful situations in the world so that one radically disturbs those that now exist. Uh, I wouldn't say, suggest that the uh, CETO Treaty, one of the most, one of the greatest of Mr. Dulles's aberrations, should be denounced. <laughs> it is sufficient that the Asian members know that it is simply being allowed, allowed to die on the vine. Even the liquidation of the Indochina disaster will not, uh, is not something uh, that can be accomplished overnight. Although I must say I basically feel that our policy there should be uh, one of negotiating an amnesty uh, so that we do not leave people who have been associated with us uh, in danger of imprisonment or in danger of their lives, that we allow anybody who has been associated with us and who feels threatened to come to the United States. And having done that, and having uh, the assurance, of course, uh, that the prisoners of war will be released as we withdraw. Prisoners of war are never kept after the end of a war. Mr. Nixon is using that as a ploy. Uh, uh, Having satisfied uh, ourselves on those points, I would withdraw. I would have, uh, I would be in favor of what has come to be called uh, the, the gravel plan. Everybody here familiar with the gravel plan? Uh, good Lord, you might be asked about that on your examination. So, uh, it's, it's named for Senator Gravel of Alaska. Uh, but has been shortened to the gravel plan. Um, it, uh, it grows out of a television show that he was on, oh, about a year ago, so last September, last uh, uh, February, January, February. Uh, somebody in New York, some road company, Severide, said, uh, 
Uh, Senator, what's, uh, what's your plan for Vietnam? Uh, nobody had ever asked Mike about his views on foreign policy up till that time, so he was caught kind of unawares, and so, uh, uh, withdraw, withdraw. And this caught then the television man, uh, who was a slow thinker, uh, rather, <laughs> rather unawares. Uh, he'd expected at least a, a, you know, a good, succinct ten-minute answer. And uh, uh, so he said, well, uh, uh, Senator, how, how would you go about implementing that program? And uh, Senator Gravel said, oh, uh, some by air and the rest by ship. And, uh, The strength of the nations of the third world in relation to the two superpowers lies in the absence of levers by which they can be controlled and the absence of anything at the end of the levers. Without public administration, without a developed industrial structure, it isn't really possible much to control a country. It isn't possible to have any control over Laos, where the writ of the government has never run out beyond the airport. This, it is this particular anarch, anarchic structure of the underdeveloped world that accords it immunity, and it accords it equally, it accords it immunity equally to effective intervention by the communist powers and by the United States. Although one guesses that the Soviets have seen the impracticability of socialism without previous preparation, one can't, of course, guarantee against such intervention. One can only be certain that Soviet and Chinese efforts to dominate these countries will uh, encounter the same obdurate circumstances and the same hostility that we have encountered. They will end accordingly in frustration not different from that of the United States in Vietnam or their own experience in Indonesia. The course here urged that I'm urging this evening does not mean that all will be well in the third world. This world has no monopoly on peaceful behavior. Uh, some occasional doctrine about the virtue of poverty, pe uh, people who live in poverty to the contrary. The possibility of struggle within and between nations and peoples in this world remains. So we're reminded in the terribly bitter case of Pakistan in these last weeks. American withdrawal will not ensure good international behavior, nor will it ensure greater reliance on collective reaction to attacks by one country on another, although that's to be hoped for. It will not prevent countries from denoting themselves communist. What we do is accept only the lessons of the last decade, which is that our intervention does us no good, and for the people involved, can make everything worse. In recent months, I think there has been some movement along these lines. I think some movement, although there's been a certain inconsistent Cold War rhetoric accompanying it, some movement in this direction is implicit in what Mr. Nixon called, speaks for when he refers to the Nixon Doctrine. This is very much to be welcomed. But it will now be clear that what, is, what I am here proposing is no mere matter of announcing a change in policy. The present policy sustains and empowers a very large and very powerful organization. The needed policy disestablishes this bureaucracy. I think myself one of the constraints on our policy in the future must be indeed that we have no policy, no foreign policy, which requires a bureaucracy that we cannot control. Though we mustn't be in any doubt as to the extent of the exercise of presidential and other political authority that will be needed. It is not easy, I frank to say, to associate the necessary action, the necessary energy with the relatively passive tendencies of President Nixon. 
I, in my, my present nonpartisan mood this evening, uh, <laughs> I must say that I e would be even more unwilling to see this uh, entrusted to the Washington, New York legal establishment on which the Democrats have relied for their foreign policy in the past. Uh, whatever we do in the future, I don't think we ever want to entrust foreign policy again to the people who have been associated with the past disaster and who work so comfortably with the Pentagon in bringing it about. They We shall have to have a new man. The proper policy toward the third world requires not only new doctrine, but also elimination of the need for a large part of the military, intelligence, and civilian bureaucracy that conducts the present policy. It would be naive to suppose that these organizations will acquiesce easily in the change. It will not only take a new man, but it will take men of real power and determination to return not only our policy to its proper size, but the organizations that pursue that policy to their proper size. Thank you very much.